All right. Good morning, everyone in the room and online. Welcome to day four, I believe, of our uh, advanced research computing intro to Sakai bootcamp. This morning, we're going to discuss running jobs on Sakai. This afternoon, parallel computing on Sakai. My name's Jeff Gardner. I'm the cloud research specialist for all of you that are new here. We have a few helpers today. Jerry Lee, our life science specialist. Um, Liz Kinney, our manager, is here. And we have a few ARC folks online as well. So before we get started, I uh, just want to run through a few things. We would like to acknowledge that UBC uh, Vancouver, a Point Grey campus, and the UBC Okanagan campus are on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam people and Silex Okanagan peoples, respectively. A few housekeeping things. This might be getting a little bit old for some of you, but just to go through it one more time. For those of you online, you've been muted automatically when you enter the room. The webinar is being recorded. The recording for this session will be made available after the um, session on the ARCS website, not immediately after, maybe uh, next week if, uh, if all things go well, but it will be available on the ARC website. All materials for the boot camp are available in the Open Science Framework. For those of you in the room, I've put the link up on the page. And I think for those of you on the Zoom, you might be able to see that, but they're also linked here. Materials for the session are at osf.io slash Myra, if that helps. And to note, this is a hybrid learning environment. We're trying this for the first time post pandemic. Well, it's not really post, but um, late in the pandemic. So please bear with us here. Virtual questions can be asked via the Zoom QA, QA or raising a virtual hand and we will unmute you. Live questions in either this room or in the room in the Okanagan can be asked by raising your hand and we will um, repeat or discuss your question so everyone virtually and in the room can hear it. And live, oh, covered that in the bottom there. And it is assumed that you can connect to Sakai for this session. If you have not connected, please visit osf.io jcm29. Um, there is gonna be a little bit of hands-on today. So, um, We'll connect together, give you time to type out commands and that sort of thing. If you would prefer, you're more than welcome to just follow along and then um, go through um, hands-on on, on your own time. You will have access um, for about a week to play around a little bit if you don't if you didn't previously have access to Sakai. And lastly, we do want your feedback. Time will be given towards the end of the session to complete a very short back feedback short feedback form. Online learners will receive a Zoom prompt when the webinar ends. And for those of you in person, we have the link on our OSF page. I'm not sure if it's on all pages or um, if it's just on the landing page for everyone, the Zoom. Okay, it's on each page. So if you head to osf.io slash myruff, you'll be able to see the feedback form there. It's very short, just a quick rating of um, how you found the session, but also we do appreciate any sort of um, text-based feedback you have. So what are we gonna cover today? We're gonna do a brief run through of the Sakai technical specifications. We've covered it in a few different sessions already, but I do wanna hit again on a few key points that you need to consider that are helpful to consider when you're running jobs. We'll walk through the PBS job script. For those of you that attended the GPU session yesterday, as well as the software installation. We did briefly touch on the job script, but we'll talk about it in a little bit more depth. We'll describe some types of high performance computing jobs, as well as a quick primer on estimating resources. Then we'll submit a job using QSub. So we'll do this together. This should take us up to the break. And then after that, when we come back, we'll describe how to monitor, troubleshoot, and review your job. And we'll do a little bit of hands-on there. Um, similar to the GPU session yesterday, we'll try to keep this somewhat according to a typical class schedule. We'll go to about um, 50 minutes past the hour, take a 10 minute break and come back for another 50. So brief disclaimer here, this isn't usually my style because I find I zone out when I see a lot of text. However, um, I did kind of go off brand. Some of the slides in the session are particularly text heavy like this one, although it does get worse. Um, so don't worry about reading everything during the presentation. You can either listen to me, or if you don't want to listen to me, feel free to read the slide. If you have any questions about what I say or what you read, um, feel free to ask a question um, based on whatever modality you're participating in. The purpose of this is to provide you more of a 
robust um, um, resource in addition to our technical user documentation. If you want to follow up on something after the session, I know I wasn't a particularly good in-person learner. I wasn't a good note taker. Um, and I didn't absorb a lot during um, a class or a session. So I had to go afterwards and, um, and kind of learn on my own. So I wanted to be a little bit more complete on some things here, just so you can use this as a heavier resource. So apologies, um, hopefully it's not too much. So Sakai technical specifications. We're gonna have a brief review of the Sakai architecture that we discussed in the intro to Sakai session. We'll review the node specifications and describe some key architecture and node concepts to understand when submitting jobs. So we're not gonna do a deep dive into everything like we touched on the intro, but I do wanna highlight some things um, to keep in the back of your mind when you are submitting a job or when you're considering submitting a job. So back to this slide, um, we're gonna be connecting to Sakai or you've already connected to Sakai from the internet or from the UBC network more specifically to one of the login nodes. The login node will then give you access to project and scratch storage space, spaces, two separate file systems. And then if you want to run a job, remember you're not gonna be running your script on the login node. Um, you're gonna be submitting it to the scheduler and that's gonna be using the PDS script we're gonna be talking about today. And it's gonna be running on a compute node. The compute nodes will have various combinations of CPU, um, possibly GPU, RAM and disk space. Um, the main thing I want you to, to impart upon this, uh, aside from the brief primer, is when you're playing around on Sakai, when you've logged in and you're in a login node, um, as we'll be on today, you're, you're connected to the internet, you can pull down software from the internet, you can transfer data from the internet, but once your job is on a compute node, you lose access to that, that internet connection and your job is running independently. So if you need data for um, your analysis, if you need a, a Python package or an R package, that has to be pulled down and on the system before your job runs. If it isn't, it will try to look for it or pull it from the internet and your job will be terminated. So that's just one thing I want to key on with the Sakai structure here. The other thing of course is um, if you're gonna be running anything significant, it's good to submit um, or um, required to submit it to the scheduler to run. The other thing is that we've touched on a few times and I know is maybe led to a bit of confusion is Sakai has different types of nodes. So going back here, we have our login nodes. Um, this, while not true to scale, um, the login nodes on the screen are true to quantity. So we have three login nodes. You will be dynamically allocated or assigned to um, one of the login nodes. It typically doesn't matter which one you're assigned to, although you do have the option of, of specifying that. And we have instructions to um, choose your login node on the technical user documentation. That said, um, we have three login nodes. The meat of your calculations or your computations analysis is gonna happen on one of the compute nodes, which is in the green box up above. One thing to, or a few things actually, sorry, to note is the total number of cores in each node. So one node, uh, we have, let's take number one, for example, um, we have 210 nodes, each made up of 32 cores, each containing six gigabytes per core per CPU for a total of 120, or sorry, 192 gigabytes of system memory. Um, this will be kind of key once your jobs start getting bigger and you need many cores. If you're, um, if you're requesting over 32 cores, your job is going to run on a more limited number of nodes. There are also job limits, which will dictate how many resources you can request and which nodes you can be assigned to based on that request. I'm gonna get into a little bit more detail on some of these um, considerations with Sakai in just a moment, especially as it comes to system memory. So if you're running a very memory intensive compute job and you think, uh, well, I just need um, 192 or less. And so I'm gonna select 192. There are some issues with that and you won't be able to run on a, one of the base nodes, but I'll, I'll touch on that shortly. The other thing, as we talked about um, yesterday, 
with the GPU course is we have a total of 50 GPU nodes. Each node has four uh, GPUs of the 16 or 32 gigabit, gigabyte variety. The last two, which we, um, two nodes, which we haven't really talked about um, yet in this course, are the data transfer nodes in yellow at the bottom. Um, those are a, a nice way to transfer big data in the terabytes that don't put uh, or take load off the, the standard login nodes. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that more tomorrow in our transferring data section. So having said all that, why is this important? The login nodes are ideal or are um, there to access Sockeye for you to submit your jobs to the compute nodes, set up your environment, do some transfers. And even I said, do not run analyses here. A little bit of analysis is okay. You might need to um, do a bit of maybe some profiling of a section of your, of your job script. You may need to um, do a little bit of troubleshooting. That's okay to do here. If a job fails or um, you need to tweak something with your script and run it, it's perfectly okay to do a little bit. Once you start to get into an actual like big job, that's when you want to submit it to a compute node. The data transfer nodes are really ideal for that large data transfer to take the load off the login nodes. If people are running jobs on the, the login nodes, it will start to put more pressure and load on the login nodes and slow things down for everyone. We do monitor that. We monitor the, the load on the login nodes. And if we see someone running a job or doing something very intensive, we will reach out to ensure that um, um, that's killed. The compute nodes, as I mentioned, are not connected to the internet and also be aware of resource limits uh, with CPU, memory, and wall time, which we'll get into more detail uh, shortly. I apologize, we're getting a bit text heavy already and we're getting small font heavy. Um, but one thing to start to key on here related to that node specifications table is each node reserves a small portion of the total memory. So going back to that 192 uh, GB I mentioned and um, doubling and quadrupling that for the bigger nodes, a small portion of that memory is reserved for system requirements. Um, for example, the operating system, and not all physical memory listed is available for running jobs. So to allow your job to run on any node, limit the requested memory to 187 GB per node. We also have um, sort of a, a guideline for the medium or large and large nodes. We have a table in this in our technical user documentation under the About Sockeye section, uh, listing this as well as in our job monitoring and troubleshooting page, and we'll, we'll reference this again. But it's usually good practice if you do need to max out your memory, just take off 5 to 10 GB from the limit to be able to run on any node or specific node. More text, there are only 200 GPUs and four GPUs per node. To specifically request a 32 GB VRAM GPU node, use the GPU mem equals 32 GB resource request. We talked a little bit about that yesterday, um, and we do have a note about this in our user documentation. Just note that there are only 16 and 32 GB VRAM GPUs. So if you specify a value outside of 16 or 32, your job will not run. And reminder, one more time, the GPU, like any SOC IQ, um, especially if you're requesting big resources, can be quite busy. Be patient. Your job may take some time to run. Um, we'll talk about this more in our job monitoring review section. And for those of you on the slides, the hyperlink there um, links you to our, our monitoring and review documentation, which will walk you through some ways you can troubleshoot why your job may not be running. So back to your directories in an allocation. We have your home. This is where you land when you log into Sokka. Um, this is your space. No one has access that to you except you. We can access that if you give us permission, if we're helping you troubleshoot something, but you, only you have access to that. Your project spaces and your scratch space um, are shared between your research team. So if you put data there, unless you change the permissions, that's accessible by everyone within your team. This is good play. These are good places for your big shared data or um, database files like an SQL Lite file. There's no file storage limitations in project um, or file count limitations. There are file storage limits overall. Typically, when everyone 
or when you get a new allocation or you're part of an allocation on Sockeye, you're limited to five terabytes in storage or storage in project and five terabytes storage in Scratch. Scratch is a good place to submit your batch jobs from, store your job scripts. There is a limit of 1 million files per allocation, and this is a, um, a gotcha, I suppose you could say. We see that comes up every so often in people with people running jobs. Um, one thing we'll often see is projects can be underutilized, and everyone runs their jobs and stores files in Scratch. And if you do hit that 1 million file limit, your job will be terminated. So why is this important? I've harped on a few of these things, but I'm gonna harp on them again because I want them really burned into your memory. They're easy mistakes for people to make. Job out, jobs will fail if the output is written to scratch. So I didn't really touch on that here, but as Nick mentioned on Tuesday, um, all directories, whether you're in a login node or a compute node, a job is running from a compute node, all directories can be read from. Um, so on your compute node, you can read from home, project, or scratch. You can write to any directory on a login node, but the key gotcha here is when your job is running on a compute node, it can only write to scratch. So if you have your script set up to try to write to project or home, your job will fail and be terminated. Um, so one thing, what you, one thing you can do is you can read from scratch, write to scratch, However, we do also strongly uh, encourage people to read from project and write to project, or sorry, write to scratch. This does provide, this does um, require some modification of your script, but it's not, um, it's not too cumbersome. I mentioned your home directory is private, um, but one key thing with using project and scratch, if you are storing software and data that you want to be shared amongst your team, Project and Scratch is a great place for it because everyone can access that. The caveat is just to be just to ensure that you're you have some good uh, data management practices so people know what they're playing with or touching or potentially deleting. Jobs will fail if data or software needs to be downloaded while your job's running. I talked about that briefly. The um, you're not connected to the compute node on Sockeye. So what we're going to do quickly now, just to get uh, ahead, for those of you that would like to follow along in Sockeye, we're not going to be doing anything too heavy right now, but I'm going to take a quick minute, um, have everyone connect to Sockeye, and then we'll enter a few commands, and then you'll be ready to go when we, uh, when we get you to submit a job. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen briefly, um, and I will share a different screen. And I'll just make this a little bit bigger. So hopefully everyone can see that okay. So I'm gonna start by typing in SSH mycwl at sockeye.arc.ubc.ca. We've all been here. Dual factor authentication. Okay, so now I'm in my home space. If I type in PWD, print working directory, I can see I'm in my home space. The command I briefly talked about, which we'll jump back to in a second, was print quota, print underscore quota. If I enter that, and Nick talked a bit about this on Monday, but I think it's just important to review because it is a good way to troubleshoot why a job may have failed if you're kind of coming up at loggerheads for what the potential solution could be. What you have, I have many allocations right now. So I'll just try to find, okay, I'll start at the top. So my quota for home where I log in, I actually don't have a, a limit listed here, which is kind of odd. Normally you would have a limit of 50 GB. Uh, you would have an output of your currently used space and the number of files you've used. There's no file limit, but there is a space limit. Next, I'd go down to my scratch. This is my um, Arc Teams allocation. So you can see we've used 98.18 GB. 
we have a fairly large um, quota here, but one thing to note is your file count and your file limit. We recently cleaned this up quite a bit because we had a few Conda environments. And as we mentioned yesterday, um, Conda can generate a lot of files. One thing to look at here, if a job is failing and you may not be sure why, check where your, uh, how much you've used and check what that against your quota. The additional thing, which sometimes people miss is check your file count against your quota. The last one is your quota hard limit and used for project space and the total number of files. There's no file limit for project. So if you have many, many, many files, it is a good place to store them. Um, however, you do have a space limit. So this is a nice way just to check where, where things are at. The one other thing I'm gonna show you briefly, we talked about with the GPU co uh, course, but if I type in top, um, I can see the current running processes on Sockeye, who's using what, how much CPU, how much memory. When I'm in top, I'm gonna to hit one. This is kind of a nice to know, not really a, a need to know necessarily, but if I hit top, enter, and then one, enter, what it shows me at the very top of the screen, which I'm highlighting here, is the number of CPUs on the login node. So it's, uh, each login node has 16 CPUs uh, numbered from zero to, uh, zero to 15. So login nodes, 16 CPUs each, they are quite powerful, but we do monitor the load on them and ensure jobs aren't being run there. Okay, I'm just gonna switch back to my um, PowerPoint for a second. Okay, if I, if I suggest any more commands as we go, I may just have you try to type them out if you're still in um, Sockeye, just to avoid going back and forth. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, I didn't mention that. Uh, if you just hit Q when you're in the top, it'll pop you up, my apologies. Okay, so brief review of Sockeye. Are there any questions about what we've done so far? Yes, two. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, did it? Oh, my apologies. That is a typo. Um, so the question was, um, jobs in this slide, which I've currently opened, jobs will fail if the output is written to scratch. Um, that is a, a, a mistake on my part. I apologize for the confusion. I'll fix that and re-upload it. So if anyone refers back, um, and that's a good catch. Um, jobs will fail if the output isn't written to scratch or jobs will fail if the output is written to project. Um, so yes, thank you, good catch and apologies for that. Any other questions? Oh, no. So uh, you've taken the listening to me and reading approach. So I appreciate that and catching the... <laughs> I think there's a question in the chat. Uh, oh, perfect, Jeff had the same question. So. Um, we are good to go. All right, so moving on to the job script. So this is where we're gonna talk briefly about the, the job script for Sockeye, and then we'll get you to um, shortly to set up your own job script to run on the system. So what we're gonna do here is start by describing the PBS directives, review using software. We're not gonna do a deep dive like the software installation course yesterday. We're not gonna be installing anything. We're gonna be using the pre-installed modules on Sockeye. So module load software tool. Um, we'll describe the PBS underscore O underscore work or variable. It is a very handy thing. Um, and describe and demonstrate using different output and input and output locations in the job script. If we have time, we'll get into this a little bit more, but I don't want to, excuse me, harp on it too much because the default set up, set up um, can work for most cases. Okay, so the job script. So you're, as I mentioned, you're not going to be running your jobs on a login node. You're gonna be creating what's called a, a job script which is gonna contain the information that you want the, to run on the compute node. And so the top lines here, the um, hash or pound PBS are the instructions you're giving the scheduler to pass to the compute nodes. And then below that, the big line of um, hash hashes 
is where you're going to load your software, use this variable, which we're going to talk about in a moment, and then write your executing commands. So that might be, um, you could have some very simple shell commands. If I just wanted a job to say, hello, Jeff, I could just write echo, hello, Jeff. It's a big resource use for something so simple, but you could do that. It could be anything from a shell command to a um, running a singularity container, um, running a Python command, Python 3, Python script.py, something like that. And we'll, we'll get you doing that shortly. But of course, one thing I didn't really mention is what about the, the thing at the top, the bin bash, the shebang as it's called? this here, what do I need to know about that? I wouldn't worry about it too much if you're not familiar. It's basically required for all scripts and it tells you the or tells the operating system which type of shell script to, to use to execute your script. So in the case here where we have bin bash, it's telling us to use the bash shell. If you're using um, Python, for example, and you want to execute a, or run a Python script without typing in Python first, then you can use the Python equivalent. So I just want to briefly touch on that. It's not necessarily an HPC specific thing, but it is sometimes a question that comes up. The first line is the resource request. Um, so what you're going to be requesting. It doesn't mean it's what you're going to be using. Um, I mean, you'll be allocated that, but your, your job will not necessarily use all of those resources, especially if you throw the kitchen sink at your job. The important thing is to request a wall time. So um, the amount of time you'd like your job to run for close to what you expect to need, plus a little bit of buffer time and request the maximum memory you expect to need. We're going to talk a little bit about um, estimating your resources shortly. So don't get too hung up there. I just want to um, key on a few things about the directives. If you're using a GPU, again, a bit of a broken record, optionally specify GPU mem is 16 or 32. One of the things with the wall time here is the system doesn't know how long your job will run for. So if your job, if you request 10 hours and it only runs for two hours, it's not going to know that until after the fact. Hindsight is 2020, but it will schedule your job based on the 10 hour request. If your job needs um, 12 GB of memory and you request 64, it's going to schedule it based on that request. So just consider that um, your job is being requested or scheduled um, and allocated based on what you request, but that's not going to equal your usage. Your job name, fairly straightforward, give a name, something that means something to you or your script. Just um, be aware that it's no more than 15 characters with no white space. Your allocation code uh, for our bootcamp, it's tr dash bootcamp dash one, though that's also part of the address to your project and scratch spaces. Um, and that's part of the accounting for the scheduling and debiting your system with fair share scheduling. I'll come back to that in a little bit, but just to be aware that the allocation code is required. If you're using a GPU job or you want to run a job using GPU, you just need to ensure that dash GPU or hyphen GPU is appended to the end of that allocation code. So it's directed to the GPU queue. These two lines have popped up at the same time because they are related. The lowercase m, A, B, E, is so the scheduler can email you information about your job. The A, B, E stands for aborts, begins, and ends. It's fairly self-explanatory, but I will say it just to make sure we're all clear. Um, a gives you an e specifying A gives you an email when your job aborts. Um, B when your job starts. E when your job ends. Some people that are quite confident with things or know how to troubleshoot their job may delete this line because they don't want to be spammed with emails, especially if they're um, running their job over and over again or running many jobs. But it is nice to know when your job starts and finishes, and the job emails when they finish do provide some information about your utilization. So it is a handy place to look um, for a quick reference to see how your job is done. And right below is related the email address assigned um, to the emails that you will receive. The important it, we, we'd like you to specify a UBC email. It's always nice. There's no sensitive data going um, 
to your email. So we do see people using non-UBC emails. That's fine. If you're more on your Gmail, there's plenty of emails with this system information or with this job information going there. No data is being sent in the email. All it's being, all you're receiving is information about your job starting, finishing, and resources used. And again, these two lines are optional. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, one, uh, uh, one tip, uh, please use your own email or your supervisors. I mean, oh, yes. Definitely, they ask you to do so because we do have some cases that your supervisor was bothered, bothered by a bunch of emails in the night because you cannot expect when the job starts or finish. Thanks, Jerry. And I'm, yeah, I'm going to repeat this for the, the room. One tip from Jerry in the, the room here was um, be careful about which email you specify. So if you borrowed a script from a friend or a, a lab mate, or um, you put down your supervisor's email, they're the ones that are going to review or receive that email. It's near real time. So if you're running a lot of jobs or your job starts in the middle of the night, they're either going to be spammed with email or they might um, wake up to many emails or be woken up by email, depending on how their phone is, what have you is set up. So just be careful if you do use that, that it's an email that's fine to be receiving one or many emails. The last two lines, which I'm going to combine, are the output and error files. So this sort of sets a standard output where um, the the output of your results, unless specified to write to a different location, are directed to write to an output.txt file or an error.txt file. You can rename these. You can um, have these directed to a different path in Scratch. Again, they have to be written to Scratch, but you can have them by setting a path right elsewhere. Um, if you don't have these in, then the default is this name of the script um, from above, um, dot .o for output or dot .e for error txt. But um, these are both handy places. One, to get your output. And two, if a job fails, look in the error file. So if a job fails sort of mid-run, it's probably an issue with your, your, your um, analysis script, not this script we're talking about here. And, um, and in, if that job fails in your analysis script, the error file will have some sort of output most of the time as to where, that, where in that script failed. So that's a good starting point for troubleshooting. And we're going to talk more about this in the monitoring and troubleshooting section. Um, I've mentioned this a few times, but I'll just quickly mention it again. You must ensure that you're loading the software you want to use. So if you want to use Singularity, um, it's kind of the compute nodes are a blank slate. If you're using Singularity on a login node and you've loaded it, it needs to be loaded again in a compute node. So module load Singularity, module load Python, your software tool. The touched on that there. If you're using a virtual environment, again, that needs to be loaded and activated. So if you're using the mini conda module or virtual env module, you need to include module and, or module load, let's say mini conda, and then you must activate that environment in the job script. So it still needs to be activated to run on the compute node. Conda activate, um, source environment name, bin activate. To, to ensure that that, act, that environment with your installed software is available to run. The uh, user installed software executable, I don't wanna to touch on this too much because it can add extra confusion. If you do need to install your own software, we'd be happy to uh, talk with you online and work with you for this. But along the lines of what Jerry talked about, it either must be in your path or you can specify the full path to that executable um, to be able to run it in, in the script. And again, this might lead to some confusion. We're more than happy to discuss this with you if you need to install your own software. And we also have some information about this on our technical user documentation. The last thing I want to talk about, which is kind of a new thing for you, is the CD or change directory um, dollar sign PBS O worker. 
So the CD PBSO worker command, it's a variable as we've as we've sort of mentioned um, that stores the path to the directory your job was submitted from. Not super helpful yet, but if I'm submitting a job using the Q sub command, which will seem which will see shortly, and I have this, what it's going to do is change my working directory to that scratch space. Um, so that way, anything that's written gets by default written to that space. You can modify the output to to a scratch to your scratch space through different means or um, if you'd like, but this is a nice way where if I'm submitting a job from my scratch space in a certain location, the output will be written to that location. So it's kind of a nice handy variable. Um, and in the job script that we're going to be um, running today, I do have a little output involving that. So you can actually see it in action because sometimes it can be hard to conceptualize. And just as a reminder, um, the PBSO workdir, all caps, is a variable that stores some sort of value, like the user variable that stores a value. Putting the dollar sign in front calls the value stored. So using PBSO workdir, workdir will show will you will actually call that path that's being stored. And again, if you don't quite understand it at the moment, we'll we'll use it in practice in the job script. Okay, any questions on this so far? Yes. Um, that, that's a great question. So the question for everyone was, um, is that the best practice to put your code in the same place as your PBS script? Um, it's not necessarily, I, I suppose it somewhat depends. It is a good practice. And I think it's in some ways the easiest practice. Um, it does lead to some pitfalls. So if you have your code in um, in the same place as your um, your job submission directory with the CD um, PBS worker, then you don't need to specify the full path to that data, for example. So I can just um, I can just have um, and then the same thing with my analysis script that I'm running. Um, I can just have Python, Python script.py. Um, whereas if I had that script stored in project space, I would have to specify slash arc slash project slash uh, allocation code slash script or slash data. Um, if so, if I'm in my analysis script, um, if I want to access that data, I would just need to ensure that if it's not in the same place, um, I'm specifying the path to the full path to that space so the system knows where to find it. Um, it's an it's I think the easiest practice just to keep everything in the same spot. But where the best practice then comes in is if you no longer need to analyze or work with that data to move it to your project space. So copy it um, to project, copy it to um, a, an outer outside storage location. So a local workstation or Chinook storage, which we'll talk about tomorrow because we don't purge Scratch right now on Sockeye because we're not at capacity. But many HPC systems, um, including the Alliance, formerly Compute Canada, purges their scratch because it's so heavily used by so many researchers across the country that it needs to be done to um, ensure high performance still. So they have a purge policy, I believe, of 60 days. So if your data is not moved off, it's, um, it's potentially gone. You do receive warnings, but um, it's best to move it on project. Project, um, I won't. Um, sort of add more with um, file system explanations like the file system types, but project is also more stable than Scratch. We haven't had any losses um, that we can speak of, but um, project is more of a, um, a stable file system. And um, if you accidentally delete something, if found out soon enough, we can typically recover it for you. So the best practices there would be keep it in the same spot and then move it to project or read it from project, just specifying the full path. Bit of a long-winded answer, but I hope that, that helps. Yeah. Yes, oh, I'll 
you just beat um, it's like neck and neck. Um, yeah, so you can restore a save module um, um, environment if you've uh, if you've created one, um, which can often be handy rather than having a whole list of modules. So Jerry touched on that briefly yesterday. Um, I apologize. I'll repeat the question for those online. Can you if you've let's say you have half a dozen modules that you're using in a combination of different software packages on Sockeye, and you don't want to have to type out six different module loads, can you um, save a sort of module collection and use that module restore on your compute node? Uh, you absolutely can. So that's a nice handy way to um, save yourself some time and grief. Um, create a module package, save it as something, and then restore it on, on a compute node. Yeah. Uh I'm not positive about my question. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll try. I'll, I'll try to be clear. So I, I'm much more. I, I'm I'm terribly familiar with using either uh, installed, you know, software by me, or or or, or uh, instead of modules. And mm -hmm. I expect I'm going to be doing a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And so I, you said you didn't want to go too much into it, so we don't need to. But so basically what I would do is in the beginning of my script, I I would put the path in there to, to where my software is installed, right? Which would be in projects or in home? So we typically, so home can, yeah. So the question is, if I am installing local software, um, how, I guess, one, where's the best place to put it? And two, um, how do I call it um, so it can run my script? Um, I, I Somewhat briefly, and we can talk about it more um, offline as well if it helps, but for everyone in the, um, the rooms, the, the best place to store it typically is in your project space. There's more space in project to install things, and then um, it can typically be shared amongst other users. So, if it's in your home, that works, but you are limited by space. Um, if it's only going to be you, that's doable, but we often recommend um, in a project. The other piece is um, how do I call it? So there's two ways. You can either specify the full path to the, um, the executable part. So kind of like when we type in um, Python command or python something script.py, that python is the executable. So if you have um, software package executable, you need the full path to that, or you can add that to the all caps path that Jerry talked about yesterday, and then you only need to specify the name. Um, so then it would just be software name script.extension. Yep. So, so I'm clear. So when I'm installing the software and, and then I change the path, mm -hmm. that path works for home or projects or, or scratch that path. Yes, it just needs to be in a um, file like the bash RC that is loaded every time in a new um, set shell every session. Yeah, so if you just did um, export path equals path blah blah, mm -hmm. then that is only going to be relevant for that current session. It needs to be in your bash RC so it's loaded each time. Thanks. No problem. Okay. Um, we're going to run through a bit of an overview of types of HPC jobs now. We're not going to get into a huge amount of depth because some of them we've covered in other sessions and we could we could really discuss things for each domain, but I want to give you an idea of the types of jobs you can run. Um, so briefly, we're going to review the types of jobs, and if you want to get started with one of these, you can use one of your lab members' scripts if you're working on a similar thing, or you can start with one of our sort of default sample or starter scripts found in the running jobs page of our technical user documentation. The link is on the, the slides. Um, I think our team has been doing a good job of posting it in the Zoom chat for those online, but you can also go to arc.ubc.ca slash docs and find the information there. So types of HPC jobs, um, a serial execution job. This is just using one single CPU core on a single CPU node, or sorry, on a single node. 
These are sequential one instruction at a time CPU jobs. An OpenMP job, and I'm gonna pull up the other one at the same time. Um, OpenMP job and MPI job for message passing interface. These are parallel computing jobs. So these are really taking advantage of the, um, the cluster system of an HP or the cluster nature architecture of an HPC system. So an OpenMP job uses multiple CPU cores within a node. So if you have a job that can take advantage of parallel processing, you can, um, you can run calculations in parallel, for example. Not everything is dependent on being um, sequential, um, one calculation being dependent on the other. You can use multiple CPU cores. How this is done is either through OpenMP or MPI. And OpenMP is using um, CPU cores on a single node. So to use a login node as a conceptual example, not that you would do this on a login node, but as you saw with the login node, um, there's 16 CPU cores. So you could use OpenMP to take advantage of those 16 cores, and then you can share the memory. So on a login node, I believe it's 192 GB, or for anyone in the room, do you know how much you would request if you were wanted less than that? Or if you wanted to use all of it? You could go down to 170, yeah, that's great. Or as high as say 187. So you just have to take a little bit off the top. Um, so an OpenMP job is a parallel type of job that allows you to use multiple cores within a single node. This is, the critical thing here is, as I mentioned earlier with the, the node limits, is you have to, if you're requesting say 42 cores, um, that's going to outstrip what a single node has to offer. So your job will never run. If you need 42 cores, then you're gonna get into an MPI job, which is using many CPU cores across multiple nodes. So in my job script, um, this is now say two nodes with X number of cores and X number of uh, memory. It's called distributed memory parallels, parallelism because now you're using memory that exists in different compute nodes. So it's not just that 192 in a single node. I might be using some memory in this core or this node and some in this. Um, we're gonna talk more about this this afternoon in the parallel computing session. So I don't want to uh, take too much time to discuss it here. Um, I just want to have it highlighted for you um, as a bit of a primer. GPU jobs, we've also talked a little bit about uh, yesterday. These utilize graphics processing units or GPUs for analysis. Um, these are great for machine learning tasks, image analysis, simulations where you need highly, highly parallel compute computations that are mostly independent of each other, um, but running some sort of similar um, processing analysis. An array job um, is another sort of separate beast. I've added a few more points here because it's easy to kind of get lost on. And it is, uh, it is a nice way to um, run looping sort of um, scripts. It's an alternative. And what it, an array job allows you to do is launch a series of indiv individual jobs with submission different, same, same, but different, let's say kind of flippantly, um, submission, submission parameters. So say I have, a number of jobs which are nearly exactly the same, but I want to change maybe one input or execution parameter, otherwise things are the same. An array job can do this, and rather than submitting say five or 10 different job scripts, I can batch that up into one and then change the input parameter for each job. I've included the documentation here because there's a bit more than I can really get into for how meaty this course is, but, um, Eliza, one of our analysts who was in yesterday and perhaps online has put together a great document on this and uh, we'd be happy to kind of work with you to see if it, if it works for your research or um, uh, help you implement it. The one other one we've talked about, but I want to get out um, here is an interactive GPU or CPU job. So these are our short duration jobs, maximum of about three hours and limit the amount of compute you can use. So this would be kind of the equivalent to running on a login node, except it's a dedicated compute node that allows you to run your job script, run snippets of your job script. And it's a really 
really allows you for a live interactive analysis where, um, and that's also really the, the key purpose of it, to do some analysis, especially for some beefier sections, maybe do some profiling of a certain section and then, um, and then launch bigger jobs into the batch system with that PBS script that we've talked about. And for more information on um, running jobs, PBS script direct, directive examples, again, I'll kind of pump the running jobs documentation here. I'm happy to talk about these separately, what might work for you, what might work best for you, and um, go from there with a consultation, but I just want to run through things um, quickly here. Any questions on this? Yes. How is this one drafted if you were to queue you know, it up and then uh, it you know, becomes available in the middle of the night? So yes, that's a great question and a great point. How does the compute know? How does the interactive queue or do the interactive queues work? Um, what if I um, submit a job, have to wait for it, and then it becomes available in the middle of the night? That is one of the pitfalls of it. Um, we'll talk a little bit about um, monitoring the queues in a in the monitoring section to see if you can find opportune times to use the interactive queue. Sometimes you are limited based on the popularity of it. Because the um, we limit the number of nodes available to the interactive queue, it can be um, a GPU interactive queue, for example, can be quite popular. And you can find that maybe in the afternoon peak working time, it's just not available to you. Um, in that case, we would encourage trying to do the best you can with your um, batch job script, or maybe um, try submitting smaller jobs and scaling out and profiling that way. Um, so if you have a number of simulations or samples you need to run, um, start with a smaller number of samples and scale out, and then you can sort of estimate resources that way. Um, but it is definitely a, a bit of a limitation um, and we don't want to take too many resources away from the batch system because that is the primary um, purpose of the HPC cluster to be able to submit jobs to that set and forget. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll take a break now, just being cognizant of time. It's 9.55, we'll come back at 10.05, we'll discuss estimating resources, we'll get you to submit a job, we'll walk through that, and then we'll get on to the job monitoring, review, and troubleshooting section and um, have you walk through kind of reviewing the job that you've submitted. So let's take a brief break here. We'll come back at 10.05.
All right, welcome back everyone. Let's get started with the back half of the session. I was hoping to get through this just before we started with the break, um, but alas, here we are, we'll see how we go. So let's get into estimating resources a little bit before we get you running your, your jobs. If I can change the slide, there we go. Okay, so the single objective for this one, provide a, pre, a primer on how to estimate resources for your jobs. This isn't going to be super prescriptive or super complete, so you may come away disappointed. I hope not, but at the very least, um, it'll provide you some general concepts or ideas. I think this is something that in the future soon will provide a, a dedicated session for because there's just a lot to cover for, um, for different software types, different types of jobs. Um, I should have staged these out a little bit, but here they are, blah. Um, Let's just go through it one by one. So as I said, it's it's maybe not the best, but I think it will give you some ideas for how to start out anyway. Um, one of the critical things with your CPU usage is to start by determining whether your software and script support parallel execution. So is your analysis or are there any parts of your analysis that can be run um, independently of itself or each other? Um, and can be split up and hived into different cores. So you think of something like our GPU jobs and some image analysis where the, an image can be broken up into different pieces with the same instructions being run on it. Um, can that sort of parallel execution be, be used or do you have a very sequential uh, script where one calculation is dependent on the other, for example? If it's something like that, then you can select one CPU core. Uh, for parallel computing, if you're able to parallelize at all or uh, and, and split things up, then you need to determine whether shared memory or distributed memory, and I see I have a typo there, shared or distributed memory processing is supported. I'm not gonna harp on that too much now um, because it is that alone is a fair amount. Roman, um, one of our ARC, experts is going to be doing parallel computing this afternoon. And I would encourage you to come to that. There's a really great primer on using parallel computing um, and it'll it'll help with some of your estimating and consideration around resources. Um, that's That focuses more on the CPU side of things. Um, another piece is, and this is sort of the cop out on my end in, in keeping things shorter now, is understanding how your code scales. So unfortunately, um, I think fortunately, but maybe unfortunately for those that just want to get it done, is you do have to understand your data and the software tool you're using. Um, if you're running something with multiple simulations, multiple inputs, um, it can be good to scale your, um, your analysis out. So different batch sizes scale up and then get an idea of if it's scaling linear, linearly or logarithmically, and then be able to extrapolate from a, fall, a few smaller samples to something bigger once you start to get into some bigger runs. Um, many software, um, specialized software also comes with either test data sets um, or documentation on what to perhaps start with. So that can be a good starting point. I know another popular area for many of our existing Sakai users is the you could call it trailblazer approach where you have someone that exists in a lab that's already done it. Maybe they have some experience, maybe they don't, but they can provide you with a starting script to modify from there. Um, a lot of it also can come down to trial and error where you might start with something, throw a bunch at the wall, see what sticks, but then that's where the resource, has, the resource um, modification, review and modification really comes in. Um, if your code doesn't, if the software you're using doesn't come with data sets or the, um, the domain you're working in doesn't come with test data sets, then again, you might just want to use some sample data, some of your own. You might be able to estimate based on how things are running on your own computer. So if I have a script that I'm running on my computer, and I'm just finding it's either taking too long or um, it's just being killed at some point and I need more, you can always use some of your um, system profiling software to look at some of your CPU usage and memory usage to provide a bit of a starting point before you scale up to Sockeye. Um, 
also important to consider is your jobs are workload dependent. So do you have something that's particularly CPU heavy? Um, so you have tons of calculations in your, in your script and that's really what the dominant thing is and how that can be broken up. Is it memory intensive where um, the execution of your script is really dependent on loading data into memory for the CPU to use? So you may not have something that's incredibly computation intensive or needs to be highly paralyzed, but you have a lot of data that needs to be loaded into memory um, to be analyzed. The other one is IO or input output read write. Do you have a lot of execution that is dependent on this moving data in and out, reading and writing? Um, understanding where these bottlenecks are can help you consider where to start out with resources. And this is where profiling is also helpful, either running um, snippets of your code or understanding where bottlenecks are. Different uh, different software um, has some of them have some. Um, pre-installed modules or packages you can use with them. Some have different profilers that you might have to download, but inserting those into different parts of your code can allow you to get an idea of where bottlenecks might be, where um, um, high memory um, requests might be, and give you a, a chance to, or give you a, the poss not the possibility, that sounds not great, but give you a, a starting point with where to look. Um, for those of you that are completely new, don't have the resources, don't know where to start, uh, talk to us. Uh, send in a ticket to arc.support. Just say, I don't really know where to start. This is new to me, and we'd be happy to work with you. It's It can be easier than just sticking, throwing something at a wall and um, and really not using or not utilizing the resources or utilizing it well. Uh, we'll do our best to help. We're not re we're not experts in all types of software, uh, which have different sort of requirements and uses. But between everyone at Arc, we have enough expertise that we can help get you on the right track. So, as I said, this may not be the best sort of help, and I think we'll put in a course for this down the road. But the best I can say is understand your software, test it, talk to people that are working with you that have done this, and um, understand or test with data and consider how your pro your code scales and where bottlenecks might be. So once you've also run something, if you've taken the, I'm going to throw a lot at the, the wall approach, review, reflect, and revise, and we're going to touch on this more soon. Any questions on this? There probably are. I'm sure you all have questions, a lot of questions. Um, I don't know if I can answer them all right now, but um, I'd say reach out to us if you have any questions about where to start if you're completely lost. Okay, with that, let's get you on to submitting a job using QSub if you've never used one before or submitted one before. So submit a job using QSub. This is the objective for today or this session, this segment, this is hands-on. So I'm gonna stop sharing my Zoom screen for a moment. For those of you that would like to follow along, um, you can pull up your terminal. Mine is not being shared, so I will share it. Okay. It's me and it's my screen. Okay, so everyone, uh, hopefully you're still in your login node uh, on Sockeye. If not, I'll give you a chance to log in. What I'm going to do is everyone has access to the TR bootcamp allocation. What I'm gonna get you to do is go there. I'm gonna type it in slowly so that everyone has a chance to go there with me. And if you don't have the allocation code, listen to me, type it, watch my screen. But if you want to copy and paste it, you hate typing, just type in groups, your CWL, mine is this, hit enter. And this is a lot more than what you're gonna have, but I can see towards the bottom, I have the TR bootcamp one allocation. That's the one I'm gonna use. That's the one you're going to use. So I'm gonna type now CD for change directory, slash scratch. We're gonna be working in our scratch directory. Then I'm gonna use that, to, I'm gonna type it in. You can copy and paste it if you'd like tr-bootcamp 
dash one. And that's just where we're going to start. So I'll type that, hit enter. I'll ensure I'm there with the PWD. I am. And now let's take a look at what's going on with LS. So we have some people who have some stuff from the other day. Um, if you're one of those people, you can use that. If you don't want to use what you have there, you're more than welcome to create something else. I have a folder here called my name. Don't do what I'm doing now. Oops, I'm going to, I don't think there's anything in there. No, okay. So now you can follow along with me. What we're gonna start by doing is get you to create your own directory if you haven't done so yet. If you have created a directory, you want to use it here, just hang on for a moment. I'm gonna do make mk dir to create a directory and I'm gonna call it my CWL. This is a usually a good thing to do when you're in a working allocation, create your own working space. That way, if you have your own data, your own scripts, whatever, you can put it there, helps with the organization. What I'm gonna do now, I'm still in, I've created a directory, I'm still in the scratch space, TR bootcamp one, and now I can see I have my directory JCYC LE3. What I'm gonna do now is I'm in a CD space R-U-N-N-I-N-G running dash or hyphen jobs. I'm gonna change to this directory, which I've created. All of you should have access to that. So CD space running jobs, running dash jobs, enter. And then I'll type PWD. I'm in that directory. I'll type LS and I have three files. Ignore right now the final. This is just if anyone has any errors and they need to jump to the end. Otherwise, we're going to use the bootcamp.py and the myjob.pbs. So um, we're going to type in the same command here. I'll do it slowly and I'll make sure everyone gets to where they need to be. You're going to make your own copies of these files. So what I want you to do is type cp space bootcamp dot pi and then my job dot pbs and what we're going to do is copy those files into the directory or folder you just created so we'll add another space i'm going to type dot dot two dots that is shorthand for the previous working directory two dots slash and then your directory name that you just created yep the my job no it should create but yeah um so i'm going to type that dot dot for previous working directory slash j cycle three slash and that should copy those two files into that directory i just created so once i've done that i'm going to hit enter and nothing happened. I'm going to go back up into the directory in one command, cd space dot dot slash jcyc le3 or your directory name. So this is going to move you up one directory and then into the one you just created. Slash enter. And now if you type ls, you should have these two files in your directory. Everyone good? Let's do it following along. And if you're online, let us know if you have any issues. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna open the myjob.pbs. So if you have a preferred text editor um, that you use, like some people like VI, Vim, I like that. There's a bit of a learning curve, a lot of a learning curve with that. So I'm not gonna get you to do that. Um, I'm gonna get you, if you're not familiar at all, to type nano my job dot pbs and enter. I've started this a little bit for you, but we're gonna go through and complete some things together and feel free to change anything else that you might like. The bin bash shebang, we can leave. I've already set this just to get things to run quickly at a wall time of five minutes, selecting one node, 
one CPU and two GB of memory. You can leave all this. This you would be modifying for your own jobs. I've given the job name, my dash bootcamp, sort of abbreviated um, dash job. If you wanna change that to Jerry's job, this is Jerry's world and we're just living in it. That's too long. Remember 15 character limit, um, but this would be where you put your name. The allocation code where your job is debit, debited from for scheduling is tr-bootcamp-one. Leave that. For your name at UBC, put in an email address you'd like so you can toggle down with the arrows and then just start deleting the old email address. I'm gonna put in my UBC email, put in whatever you'd like. Uh, because I would like you to receive an email just so you can see what the output is there. We'll leave the ABE so you get all. And then the output and error files, we're going to leave those. Um, give them a name if you'd like. So I can change mine to output bootcamp, error.bootcamp. Um, but those are going to be written to your, um, your software or your, your scratch directory that you're in right now. Continue to toggle down. I've got a little simple Python script set up. If you haven't used Python, it's not a simple script, but um, it's, a, it's a simple script that just executes very quickly. So think of it as simple that way. For software, I want to be able to use Python. Python does not exist in the compute node until, for me until I've loaded it. So I'm going to type in, I've deleted that software in the carrots below. I'm gonna type in Python, I, I remember the version. If you don't remember the version, um, you can use commands in the login node to look it up. So module spider Python as a keyword search or module avail enter to give you just a whole list of currently modules currently available to you. But for this case, I'm just gonna talk you through this. One of the Python modules that we have available to load is Python 3.8.10. So to type that in, I would module load Python forward slash 3.8.10. I'm gonna keep this command here, um, change directory, PBS working directory. And this is just going to ensure that this job script, the working directory is the same as the one I'm submitting this job from. And I have a little output for you um, that should pop up in your output to confirm this. The other thing we're going to leave here is Python 3 bootcamp.py. And this is going to execute the bootcamp Python script that I created. Um, for those of you that would not be using a module or would be using your own software, this is where you could leave out the module command, have either um, the full path to your executable version and script. Okay, so is everyone good here? In the room at least? Okay, perfect. So what I'm gonna do now is to exit, I'm gonna use control exit um, on my computer. It will give me a prompt, save modified buffer. Yes, don't type no. Oops, what have I done there? I've screwed up now. Okay, save modified buffer. Yes, I don't know. Oops, myjob.pbs. Don't change anything in myjob.pbs. You can just leave that and hit enter. And you should be back in your terminal. Everyone good there? Okay, so what happens now? We've got a script, it's ready to go. It's ready to submit. I'm gonna type in Q sub, and this is the PBS command for submitting a job. I'm now gonna type in my job. Oh, I'm sorry, don't type in anything yet. There's one other thing I want you to put in the script. So you can type in one more time, nano my job dot PBS. Oh, I didn't type my job. Nano my job dot PBS, open that up again and Toggle down to where you have your command python3 bootcamp.py. And just below that, because this script is actually going to run very, very quickly because there's no real processing, we're going to type in the Unix command sleep. And then 
120. What this is going to do is the sleep command just tells the system basically to idle for a certain period of time. In this case, I'm telling it to idle for 120 seconds or two minutes. Our wall time is five minutes, so this is well under that. All I want you to do with this here is um, when your job completes, it shows that it's actually been running for two minutes rather than zero minutes because the command will execute so quickly. Um, it just gives us a little bit of breathing room time when we actually look at our job and running time. So once you've typed in sleep 120, we'll exit again, we'll save the modified buffer, file name to write, don't change anything, and now we're back in the login node. From here, now we can submit our compute job. Q sub, Q S U B, my job, dot PBS, enter, and it'll show you that you've been given a job, you've been assigned a job number. I'm just gonna check the Q and A quickly. Do you, need, do you need to activate Python in this case? So no, um, in this case, because we're not using Python in a virtual environment, we're using a pre-installed Python module. You just need to load that module. So um, there's nothing to activate there. By module load Python, the software is available there for you to use. You do need to activ activate a Conda environment or a virtual env environment if you want to use Python, if you've installed it in that, in that fashion. Okay, so that's submitting a cute compute job. We're gonna leave that there for a moment. Um, what you can do before I go back to the slides is type qstat dash u. If you don't remember your CWL, hopefully everyone does, but if you don't remember your CWL, just type in dollar sign qstat user in all caps, enter, and you should see your job is running. If you don't do it quickly enough, your job may not be running. If it's not running, that's okay. Um, we, can, we can help address it. And even if your job failed, um, it started running and failed, that will still work for the next section. So I'm gonna leave that for the moment. Go back to sharing my presentation. And are there any questions about what we just did here? There's a lot of different variations with that, but are there any sort of questions on the um, what we did to the script, what we changed um, in executing software? No, I think we're good at the moment. Okay, so moving on to job monitoring, troubling, shooting, and review. I think this is one of the biggest areas um, that people can benefit from the job running over time your job's probably gonna fail a bunch. I still have jobs that fail, especially because I do something boneheaded. I miss a word, Jerry called me. I had my.pbs instead of my job.pbs. Um, when I was creating this, I had a stupid error in the, I mean, there's no such thing as a stupid error, but trust me, you will start swearing and say it's a stupid error when you make a spelling mistake or make another mistake. That's fine. If a job fails, that's fine. You're not gonna break the system. It, the annoying thing is going back and finding it and fixing it. So in my Python script that um, you're using, I had a, um, I was calling a function and I spelt that function wrong when I was testing it. I had to go back and fix it and recopy it to the uh, bootcamp. It's going to happen. That's fine. Um, they, but this is, this is where I think um, a lot of people can benefit from being able to monitor, troubleshoot, review where those errors are. Um, and then it is quite gratifying to be able to fix that error on your own. Not that we're not willing to help you, we certainly are, but um, this will at least, I think, hopefully give you the tools to be able to get as far as you can before you need um, further help. And what we're gonna talk about then is briefly touch on some analysis pipeline best practices. Define and describe the QStat command. This, ca this command is your friend for reviewing where things are at, reviewing how your job is doing, reviewing how your job is done, um, and looking at the job queues, the user queues, and your job statistics on Sakai. And then we'll discuss some strategies for troubleshooting failed or not running jobs. 
We've got about 20 minutes left. I think we'll be able to get through all of this, but at the very least, as I warned you, we're very text heavy here. So if um, if we if we butt up against time, uh, there's enough here, I think, that you can walk through on your own as well. But I'll do my best to explain things. Why are we here with this section? What do you really care about? Not me talking, not all the words. You want to run your jobs. Your job isn't running. How is my job doing? And how did my job do? Often, I think people care about the first one. We know they care about the first one because we hear about it. And I know it's something I care about because I want to make sure your job's running. One thing or two things we'd really like to see people um, not care about because that sounds like you don't care, but really do to improve to become one, a better HPC system, but our HPC system, but also to become just a better, a better user, to feel good about your um your use of the system and be an asset to your research team, to yourself and develop as you go, uh, is to really pay close attention to how your job is doing and how did my job do. So I talked a little bit about this yesterday, but for those of you that weren't here in the GPU session, um, there's sort of a, a processing pipeline or analysis pipeline. I think there's the one we see sometimes, and then there's the ideal one. And that would be some degree of planning and resource estimation, and then job submission, which we just did now. Often, I think people can get to here, and I've been guilty of it, and then you get into this feedback loop of something failed, I'm gonna fix my little error, I'm gonna fix that typo, whatever I did, I'm gonna submit my job again, I, I have something different, I'm working on a different image, I'm working on some different analysis, but I've already got a script that I can just apply as a blanket to everything. I'm just gonna change my execution code and submit again. What we'd like to see is once you've submitted your job, perform some monitoring, whether that's during the job or after, monitoring is huge. From there, you can look at the job performance analysis. There's two sides to this. There's the, the anal analyzing how well your analysis script did, so improving the code itself. And then there's also analysis and analyzing, I, I'm losing my ability to speak, but there's also the analysis of your job script, namely the resources you requested. Am I requesting too much? Am I requesting too little? If you're requesting too little, your job may have failed. From there, we then, you can go back to revisiting and modifying your request and resubmitting. So from that, let's get into the QSTAT command. So the two main commands you're gonna be using when interacting with the PBS scheduler, when interacting with Sockeye, are QSub to submit your job and QSTAT to monitor your job. So this will display the state of job queues and individual jobs. It also displays um, the display of, or the state of a server, but that's kind of outside the scope of this and not really needed for, as at a user level. There's many options, a few big ones we're gonna talk about that can modify this command. But if you really want to get into the weeds, the PBS professional big book, it's a big book, like big, big book. They've combined, I think, the, the user guide and the professional guide into this one. It's actually really great. It is pretty reader friendly. But if you want more um, information on everything outside of this, the book's got it. But otherwise, see section 10 for information on QStat command. Why is this important? Why do you care? It allows you to check how busy a, a queue is. It allows you to get starting information on why your job may not be running. It helps you determine why your job may have failed. And it helps you review the resources you've used and can modify for future jobs. So from the top, to list all jobs in a specific queue, use the command qstat queue name. Always when we teach or typically when we teach, drop the carrots with the queue name. That's something that we make the mistake of. We're not always explicit. It's not a mistake on your end. It's just something that if you're following things verbatim, which you should, um, it can be an easy error to, to see. How do I find the queue name? Review the systems partition table in our technical user documentation. Here's the link. Or as we we're focusing on here, use the queue stack command. So in our user documentation, this is what the queue names look like. Sockeye, Parallel, 
underscore L, serial underscore L, they're right there. If you don't want to go and review the technical user documentation, we're going to do it on Sakai in a second. However, in our user documentation, there's also some nice information. The minimum wall time, the maximum wall time, so it's 168 hours or seven days. If you request more than seven days, your job is not going to run. As well as the node types, uh, base, medium, large, which carry some other significance, which include memory maximums and excuse me, um, CPU maximums. Let's say you want to do this in um, Sockeye though. There's, I'm gonna show you the output on here. So I'm not gonna to toggle my back to my um, terminal just to save time. But if you'd like to follow along, you can do this yourself right now in Sockeye. So what you can type in your login node is qstat space dash uppercase Q and then hit enter. And this output gives you, it'll look something like this. There may be a bit more up top, but what it'll tell you mainly is here are the queues in Sakai. It'll tell you how many jobs are queued, how many jobs are running, maybe how many are held, for example. This most of the time isn't gonna to be too helpful for you. Where I think it can be most advantageous is to the earlier question of, um, I want to run a job in an interactive CPU or interactive GPU queue. What I can do is type that command um, qstat space q name, and I can get an idea of how active um, the interactive queue is. If it's heavily used right now and people are early in their three hour wall time, you might be waiting a while. So it, it can help you at least query, query how busy things are there. A slight modification to this is using the qstat space dash lowercase q command, and you'll get a same, same, but different output. Again, it'll show you the list of queues on the far left, but it'll also show you some of the maximums. So the maximum wall time you can request for a queue, um, as well as the running and queue jobs. Your output will look a little bit different than mine because I took a snapshot a while back. Typically, you're not going to need to worry about this um, unless your memory threat requests or CPU requests dictate which queue you're going to be going into. Submitting a standard request will allocate you into the most available queue for you. But again, this is um, it provides a bit of an example of the output or the power of the queue stat command and is more bef beneficial for looking up an interactive queue and how busy it is. To see a summary of your submitted jobs, we already did this. We used the command qstat u dollar sign user. Just as a reminder again, user is, avail is a variable that stores your username, in this case, your CWL. Using the dollar sign in front of that variable calls that value. Alternatively then, you could use the qstat command dash u and then just your CWL to get the same output. So what I would type is qstat space dash u space jcycle3 and I get the output that we saw earlier. If you did that now and your job's finished, you're not gonna see anything. So a little tip here, if you want to see all of the jobs you've recently run, including those that have completed in any fashion, so whether that's finished running successfully, failed in some capacity, or they've been terminated in some capacity, adding the X option to the dash U will show completed or otherwise finished jobs. And I've shown two examples below. So for the job that you just submitted, if you were to run qstat dash XU user or CWL, this should then show you, show you that job. So I'm just gonna show you an example here. Um, the input in the output. So here I've run three jobs. The S for status, which I'll talk about in just a moment, um, is all F. F does not necessarily mean failed. You're probably, you could think, uh, may think, crap, my job failed. It didn't see complete. That's not complete. That's not the case. Your job is just finished. Um, there are a few nice things with this section on its own. What can this tell us? If you've if you recall back to when you submitted your job, you got that little output of your job 
ID information. If you've done a whole whack of stuff since that job has been submitted and it's buried somewhere and you want to look deeper into your job, you can run this command to get your job ID or your recent job IDs um, on the left, far left column. Um, additionally, you can see which queue your job was submitted to. If I wanted to run a GPU job, but I didn't append that dash GPU, it's not gonna to go to that queue. If you want to drill down into a specific job, you can't remember which job you submitted if you got a huge list, you can reference the job name on the next column over. You can also look at the memory you've requested. So some one thing that we may see there is maybe you need that 187, but you requested 182, and now it's not gonna run on a smaller node. Here is the requested and elapsed time. So remember the time you've requested is not the time your job may necessarily need. That first job I've run is not bad. It took two hours and 34 minutes out of the three hours I requested. As long as that didn't fail, it actually ran to completion. That's fairly reasonable. Um, same with three minutes and five minutes or 10 hours and 12. Um, I've edited these to make these look pretty reasonable, but if you've requested say 100 hours and your actual elapsed time was maybe five, it's probably a good practice to bump that down to maybe 10. It's okay to give yourself a few hour buffer, just don't um, give yourself 10 times the amount, for example. And then uh, right now, we're just gonna quickly jump to job status. So the S column in this output displays the status of a current job. Most common values uh, would be B for job arrays, E, you might see if you're refreshing that job status command a lot. And this is kind of a transient um, um, status in that it'll show up as your job is transitioning from a running to an, a finished um, F state. So you may never see that. You may see it uh, briefly. It doesn't mean um, it's ending or there's some error. It just means that it's exited or exiting. H is your job is held. This might happen with an incorrect resource request. One you'll often see is your job is in the queue, waiting for resources to become available. So if, one thing to always remember is jobs will not always run instantaneously. Please be patient. Your job should hopefully run. Um, and then the R, your job is currently running. This is also in our technical user documentation, but it's here for completeness for you as well. So. We've kind of queried our job state, our job status, um, but there's sort of three important questions that still remain. Why isn't my job running? Why did my job fail? And how did it do? There's two quick commands that can help with this. One is the qstat-s job ID, which we talked a little bit about in the GPU course. And then there's the detailed review dash F for current or remember dash XF for completed with your job ID. So for you, for the QSTAT S command, and if you'd like, you can do this with your um, the job that you ran. However, um, it'll the the comment you'll receive will should be that the job completed or job has finished. If I was to run this command with one of my past jobs, QSTAT space dash S space job ID, just the digits, then I might see something like insufficient amount of resources and GPUs. I might also see NCPU or MEM. So that just means your job is in the queue, but it's waiting for resources to become available for it to be for it to be started. There are some common reasons why your job hasn't started. So if you're panicking, it's been five minutes, it's been four hours. Um, as I touched on, it may be an insufficient amount of resources. So the job should start when the required resources become available. So please be patient. It should run. Bigger requests mean your job might take, long, might take longer to run. Another one people may often see that they may not be aware of is job would cross dedicated time boundary. What does this mean? What this means is that once a month, we have a maintenance window for Sakai. It's always scheduled to be the third Tuesday, third Tuesday of the month. Um, this is regular system maintenance, security maintenance, patching. It's just to make sure that the system is up and running. Maybe there's some node or CPU repair or maintenance to do just to keep everything kind of up and running for you and secure. 
this is always going to happen. It's always going to be at least one day, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Sometimes it can run a little bit longer for bigger maintenance. Um, it may take two or three days, but typically it's a day. We do post this in our technical user documentation. There's information about the maintenance as well as a, a, a header with a little flag that alerts you to this. And when you log into Sockeye, there's a little uh, underneath that fish um, art, there's usually a yellow-ish bar that tells you system maintenance is coming. We advertised this a week before. That said, we always get tickets that say, I can't log into Sockeye, what's going on? The maintenance window. Um, you During this maintenance window, one, your job will not start or you won't be able to access access the system. But if you have a job that has that is going to run into this window, jobs have to be sort of terminated or jobs won't terminate, but jobs have to finish during this window or wait until after this window to be scheduled. So that's just what this command here means. And I've got about four minutes of instruction. I might go a minute or two over. I'll leave some time for questions. Um, if there's if your job has been queued for a while without a clear reason, take a look at the resources you've requested. So I keep harping on this, but make sure that the request is feasible. You've, requ you've requested the, a number of CPUs within the limits. Your wall time is 168 hours or less. For the most part, you're never gonna need 168 hours. I would always start with less, even if you're throwing it at the wall, um, just to kind of guess somewhere, but you're, Make sure you're not requesting more than 168 hours. Memory exceeding what's available. So ensure that you're requesting 5 to 15 GB less than a node's maximum. And then with a GPU request, make sure you're specifying 16 or 32 GB if that's what you are, um, if you do want to add that. And remember, I've mentioned this before. I've spoken to it a little bit um, here. Be patient. Sometimes your job can take a while to run. It's a shared resource with hundreds of people at UBC and external collaborators who are working uh, in partnership with different labs. If you're requesting a lot, it can take a while for your job to run. If it's taking a couple hours, if it's taking eight to 10 hours, this can be normal, sometimes longer. If it takes say more than a day or longer, um, you know, feel free to reach out to us, but we'd also encourage you to use that qstats command just to see if there's any information about why or where your job is at. Additionally, the qstat command um, allows you to look into a detailed or deeper dive into your, into your job. This can be done with the F or I believe it's full um, option and dash XF for a finished job. So this can be used for a current job to give you a, a bigger output. I'm gonna kind of gloss over this quickly, but this gives you a really meaty output, which we'll discuss in just a second. However, if I ran this with my job ID, I will jump down to the last eight lines, which can give you the same comment, not running insufficient amount, or it may say running. Um, it'll give you that comment in the dash S command as well as some other information about your job. So E time is the, is the time your job was eligible to start running. So you're accruing time or this eligible time below um, before your job runs. You may or may not see an estimated start time. That's not a hard and fast. So sometimes um, that'll happen as you get closer to your job and your job should start around this time but don't hold us or the system to that. So what can this tell us? The resources you've requested and those you've consumed, your job eligible time, and job comments similar to the qstat-s output. Why is this important to you? Going back to the resources requested, you've requested and consumed, it can tell you information about your utilization, how well you, you utilize those you requested. And then did the job fail because the resources you consumed exceeded those you requested? So for example, if I requested X amount of memory and the memory that was run was X plus 10, you should probably add at least 10 to your memory for next time um, to, to ensure that your job finishes. So if you blow out the resources that you've requested, your job will be terminated. 
You can also look into your job el eligible time and job el comments similar to the QStatS output to see previous section. This is a lot. Um, what I'm going to tell you here, and I'll leave you to this um, in the documentation or um, or reviewing here, but there's two main things I want you to think about if a job failed. Did your job fail with zero time on the clock or like immediately the job started, the job failed with all zeros, or did your job run for a little bit before failing? If your job failed immediately with all zeros on the clock, it means there's probably some sort of issue within the job script, that PBS script you submitted, something in there, maybe you didn't load a module, maybe you didn't activate a conda environment, maybe there's a typo with your job script itself. Usually it fails there because it can't even, it doesn't even get started or off the ground before it fails. If there's something that failed after maybe a minute, after two minutes, after an hour of running, there's a good chance that can be within your job script. Um, a, a exception to this might be you blew through the memory or blew through the CPUs you requested, so your job was terminated there. But if it failed after running for a while, also take a look into those error or txt file error or output txt files to see if there might be some sort of um, indication there where your script. So it might be an error at a certain line, error at line 137, um, package not found or file not found, something like that. And I have a few other tips here you can refer to why your job may have failed. And I just sort of talked about this now. Check your output, check your error.txt files. Um, this can tell you at what point your script may have failed. And that's, I believe, it. So before I say thank you, but thank you, um, before I say thank you again, I will just quickly pop into the terminal and I will share that. So what you can do if you want to apply some of this to your job now or later, bear with me, so switch back, is I can do, I can type in qstat dash xu for it to see all my completed jobs with my CWL, qstat space dash xu space CWL, I have a lot of jobs here that I've recently run, but I want the most recent one. And this is the one that you've run. QStat space dash XF space. And you can copy and paste or type in your most recent job ID. For, for me, it's 4233082. And this is that big output, which will give you information about your job. So at the top, it'll talk about CPU utilization. This was a really a nothing job, so it's gonna be zero. It'll tell you the memory you've used, the wall time you used. You can see it's just over two minutes because I set the sleep function for two minutes just to give it a bit of time. If I scroll a little bit further down, it'll go back down. It'll give you a summary of the resources you requested. And then if I scroll even closer down to those eight to maybe 10 or so lines at the bottom, you can see the comment, my job ran at this time and finished. This is how long it was, um, or what the eligible, when the eligible time started, and how much eligible time I accrued. So because it's all zeros on the clock, my job started instantly. Exit status zero just means it exited, it's completed. Um, those are, I think, some key points or highlights to, to look at, but I would say, suggest you get familiar with this because when we monitor your jobs, if you send us a ticket saying, um, what's going, my job's not running, my job failed, help. This is one of the areas what, that we will look at. And in many cases, but not all, um, the answer can be here. Um, also encourage you to look at that output and error TXT file. There might be a hint there um, and, and the comment. So just some starting points when you're troubleshooting a job. If you're still stuck, feel free to reach out to us. But um, these are common starting points we look at. Um, and then from there into your PBS script or your, your job data. So from there, I think that's it for the session. Definitely a lot. Thank you for staying with me. And um, we look forward to seeing you if you're coming in, in the parallel computing session this afternoon.
And I apologize for maybe running a minute or two over four minutes over time. Um, but thank you for persisting.